Maine, all over in Lincoln County. And all my life I went through the motions. You know, I could walk the walk, talk the talk. But it wasn't until I went off to Pensacola Christian College down in and blood and lung preacher laid out the gospel clearly and passionately. And I saw my need of Savior. And I trusted of Israel that there is a God in heaven and he is all powerful and all sufficient the nation of Israel needed to be reminded of this tremendous truth in their day and I believe it is worth repeating and referencing in our day as well that by it the world shall know there is a God on over at 1 Kings chapter 18 and look at verses 36 on down through verse 38. The Bible tells us, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near. I want you to notice that fact. He came near unto the altar and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and looked up the water that was in the trench. Let's go before the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get into the message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this group of people here today, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to come down and fellowship with them, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would open your word unto us, Lord. I pray that you would touch us and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Guide us into your word, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would please hide me behind the cross, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give me liberty to preach this morning, Lord. I pray that you would help us to hear from heaven, Lord. Help us, Lord. If we're going off track, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to realign, refocus, to get back on the right, straight and narrow way, Lord, which is the good way, Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. There's a hundred of them, right? 
We find a hundred of them, all right. But what they are doing is anything but what God called them to do. In verse 4, we find them hiding in a cave. Two things you won't find here when they're hiding in a cave. You won't find the fire falling. And secondly, you won't find the word of God. These men had leaned unto their own understanding and had cowered and quivered in fear. Proverbs 3 5 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. As these folks are hiding, as these folks are hiding in the cave, living on just bread and water, fearing the king, do you think they're trusting the Lord? No. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What spirit do you think was ruling and reigning in their lives as they're cowering in the cave? What we read here in 1 Kings chapter 18 is the exact opposite of how one is to live if they are to ever see the fire fall. But they needed to survive, right? They needed, they needed bread and water, right? What does the Bible tell us? Matthew 4, 4 tells us it is written it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. While they are there, hunkered down in that cave, the word of God is not being sound forth across the land as it ought to be. While they are hunkered down in the cave, sin is left unchecked. Bread alone is not sufficient to live by. We need the word of God. We need the Word of God. If we don't have the Word of God, we won't know how we're to walk. If we don't have the preaching of the Word of God, folks are going to be hindered from getting saved. Look, if you will, on over to the book of Amos. I want to show you another thing that's going on. book of Amos. Chapter 8.
answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou. He puts it back on Ahab. He puts blame where it belongs. But thou, in thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Just think about that for a moment. How Ahab is trying to blame old Elijah. He's saying, art thou he that troubled Israel? He's accused the man of God who is simply trying to follow the Lord, being a troublemaker. Isn't that just like many in our day? You point out blatant compromise. You point out what the Bible says clearly regarding their false doctrine. And they start squawking about you being judgmental and legalistic. Old Elijah doesn't miss a beat. He rears back and lays it out for Ahab, who the real troublemaker in the nation of Israel is. Jude 3 exhorts us to earnestly contend with me. I reckon old Elijah, he's of the opinion that we need to be earnestly contending with faith. Yeah. Notice what he does. He names and blames him. As the Bible teaches regarding false teachers, it cites what Ahab was promoting in the nation of Israel. He points the finger, <coughs> he labels Ahab, a false teacher, an instigator of false worship. As the showdown atop Mount Carmel to take place, we are confronted with the fact that not having a position for or against God is still a position. Right. A position of compromise. Right. Look at you at verse 21. Yeah. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long called ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, stay in the shadows. But <clears throat> you can see it on social media. There's always somebody wanting to scroll through the comments and just see what's going on. The people answered him, not a word. They don't want to get involved. They say, it's not my fight. <clears throat> but it is. Yes, amen. The Bible tells us the sad truth in many who straddle the fence, rarely if ever get off God does not look favorably on those who try and have one foot in the world and one foot in God's house. <coughs> Notice what the Bible tells us in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16. I know thy works. God knows what's going on in our heart. He knows what's going on when other people don't. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Think about this for a moment. God's saying, I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot. One or the other. Don't be in the middle. When you're cold, it's easy to tell. But when you're in the middle, straddle on that fence, sometimes it's easy to not see where you're truly standing. God wants people on fire for God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The prophet Elijah, here in 1 Kings chapter 18, is challenging the nation of Israel with the salient truth. Notice what the Bible tells us in Matthew 6, 24. No man, no man can serve two masters. If we get to the point where we think, I can serve both God and the world, you know, I can do both. <laughs> that that's wrong. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Notice what the Bible says. Ye cannot. When the Bible says ye cannot, ye cannot. Ye cannot serve God and man. You can't have it both ways. When the fire falls, it'll be because there was a return to the things of God. Notice if you go verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. Come near unto me. Elijah wanted the people to know what he was doing. He wanted the people to observe what he was doing, how he was doing it. Why? So they could be without excuse. 
so that in the future, those future generations where they would come, they would know the means of worship and how they were to seek God. folks. 
the great deliverer, the one who alone can turn the heart of his people back again unto God. As I read this, I'm reminded of other times in God's word when he made his presence known. For instance, the day of Pentecost, when the early church was filled with the Holy Ghost there in Acts 2 and Acts 4. But, as I read verse 38, when the Bible tells us, then the fire of the Lord fell. When this fire fell, I see a man who believed God. I see a man who trusted God, who sought God when others didn't. I see a man that when the fire fell, you see that? Did you see that? That is what my God does. He answered by fire when Baal didn't. When the prophets of Baal sought him, he was not to be found. Why? Because he is not. The Lord God, he is the God that answered by fire. I see Elijah grabbing a hold of the shoulder of the young man and saying, how long, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to keep serving Baal? And then, I mean, I don't see a man here who all stoic like is just standing there reserved and doesn't get excited. When God's presence shows up and when God shows out, that fire, it was real. It was not an illusion. God showed up, showed out. Back in 1 Kings 18.39, these folks hit the ground. Why? Because when the fire falls, man is revealed as he is before a holy and righteous and just God. Amen. What came of the fire falling was that the false worship is done away with. We see that in verse 40. Notice, they didn't, they didn't put the means of the false worship in prison or set them away for safekeeping. They didn't put them on a shelf. How many times in our own lives when we struggle with something, we come to the altar and we say, Lord, I'm surrendering this to you. But we put them on a shelf. How many times do we do that? How many times do we halt between two opinions did away with the prophets of Baal. They didn't let one of them escape. They slew them all. And when we go to get right with God, and when the Holy Spirit does a work in our lives, it shows us error in our own lives and things that need to be gotten right with God about. We need to do away with them. Folks may say, wasn't that harsh? Notice verse 40, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. Why? He doesn't want somebody going out and spreading more false doctrine. He doesn't want somebody getting out and spreading more false worship. He doesn't want someone getting away and redirecting the people back into sin. It's to be done away with. Folks may say, wasn't that harsh? Wasn't that judgmental? God didn't seem to think so. He told us again and again in his word. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate. God is the author of the doctrine of separation. Amen. Notice what the Bible says. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. If the fire is to fall, there must be a separation. Why? Because God demands it. It's not just some preference of man. It's a doctrine offered by God. Would to God that we would desire His presence and that He would reveal Himself to us in a mighty way. As the prophet Isaiah prayed in Isaiah 
4.1. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might blow down at thy presence. And do we desire the presence of an almighty, all-powerful, all-nigh-present, all-nishant God in our own lives? As the prophet Isaiah prayed, let that be our prayer in our day as well. Yes. Notice, if you will, turn on over to the book of James. The book of James, chapter 5. James, chapter 5. I want you to see this. James, chapter 5. This is something I think we need to be reminded of constantly. James, chapter 5, verses 16 on down through 18. tells us, confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. Notice this, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. Do you believe that Elijah's prayer there on Top Mount Carmel availed much? It was because of that prayer and someone seeking God that God made himself known. Notice what verse 17 tells us. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Think about this for a moment. Elijah was just like you and me. Just as much as like the person in the pew is in the pulpit. Just like each and every one of us. Notice what the Bible tells us here. Elias was subject to like passions as we are. He wasn't that much different than you and me. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her rain. Let's seek the Lord in his presence that it will be felt, and that the world may know there is a God in heaven, and he alone is God. What do we take away from this message this morning? The take away from this message is this. If the fires of the revival to fall, we must be present. We saw that back in verse 4. Secondly, there needs to be one stirring things up, pointing folks back to God. We saw that in verse 17. Thirdly, there must be a return to the old paths. We saw that in verse 30. And fourthly, we must seek the Lord in prayer. We saw that in verses 36 through 37. These are simply the fundamental building blocks of revival. If we desire presence of an almighty, all-powerful God to work in our own lives. We must seek the Lord. We must draw an eye unto God. Gypsy Smith once said, we need to, because the Bible starts in one place, in the individual first. Notice, it started in Elijah first. God lit a fire in him and set the Gypsy Smith once said, draw a circle, stand in the middle of the circle, and ask God to spark a revival in that circle, in the life of that individual. It starts in the lives of each and every one of us, individually, before it can happen corporately. Amen. How long
short break.